Good morning. I'm Joe Fryer. And I'm Savannah Sellers. Right now on Morning News Now, debate drama. Candidates square off in Pennsylvania in what's expected to be one of the closest Senate races this November. John Fetterman and Dr. Oz exchange jabs over abortion and crime, with Fetterman's health taking center stage. We've got all the big takeaways from that debate and others in some key races as both candidates try to sway remaining undecided voters. Plus, growing concerns about the safety of election workers this morning. We've got the changes being made at some voting sites with less than two weeks to go. Heaviest of battles, Ukraine is preparing for more fighting ahead in Kherson, a region Russia has controlled for most of the war. The new steps the Russians are taking to get a hold of more weapons as Ukraine tries to regain control of the major port city. Sounding the alarm, new information this morning showing that climate change is not just harming the earth, but also our health. The impact rising temperatures and air pollution are having on your overall well-being and how it's even increasing the threat of more virus outbreaks. Plus, get your passport ready. If you're planning a trip in the new year, we have a list for you. National Geographic is out with a look at the most inspiring destinations to add to your bucket list. We've got to look at the top places and why they're a must for your travel plans. Those are always fun segments. Exactly. I'm, I'm inspired go. by any vacation location. I know, but these right? will be extra inspiring. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, we'll tell you what you should add to your list. A little bit later this morning, we begin, though, with the latest in the ramp up to the midterm elections. Last night, there were debates and some key races, and we have the big moments you need to know about. Yeah, the race for governor is neck and neck in both New York and Michigan. Democratic incumbents Kathy Hochul and Gretchen Whitmer are each holding on to a slim lead over their Republican opponents. Candidates in both races faced off in debates last night. While in Pennsylvania, Lieutenant Governor John Fetterman and Dr. Mehmet Oz took the stage together in one of the most highly anticipated debates this election season. The two are vying for an open Senate seat that could shift the balance of Congress. We are breaking down some of the high stakes debates from last night. Ron Allen is standing by to talk about the New York debate. But first, let's check in with NBC News senior political editor Mark Murray. Mark, good morning to you. So yesterday we discussed Fetterman's health and whether that could be a factor in last night's debate. Early on, he addressed what he called the elephant in the room. Here's what he had to say. And let's also talk about the elephant in the room. I had a stroke. He's never let me forget that. And I might miss some words during this debate, mush two words together, but it knocked me down, but I'm going to keep coming back up. So Fetterman used that closed captioning system to read questions and answers in real time because he has auditory processing issues lingering after the stroke. So, Mark, how did he look throughout the debate? What's the reaction we're hearing this morning about any concerns that he's healthy enough to hold office? Yeah, Joe, you know, bottom line is he did struggle five months after his stroke. Uh, and, uh, you know, I think the question for Pennsylvania voters kind of going forward is, do they end up relating to that anecdote we talked about, like getting uh, getting back up after adversity? Uh, you know, a lot of people in this country have strokes and other medical situations and whether he is able to relate or whether it does raise uh, concerns about his health front and center. And Joe, you know, just with less than two weeks ago, I just don't know the answer to that question. Uh, but he did struggle uh, in his performance. He did mangle some words as he ended up saying. Uh, but his campaign was very happy that, that he was he was able to prove that he could debate five months after having a stroke. Let's get into some of the issues here. Oz and Fetterman addressed really a hot button issue concerning Pennsylvania voters. That's abortion. Dr. Oz had this to say. I want women, doctors, local uh, political leaders, letting the democracy that's always allowed our nation to thrive to put the best ideas forward so states can decide for themselves. Contrast that with my opponent, John Fetterman, who on this debate stage said that he would demand federally mandated rules for all states they'd have to follow that would allow abortion at 38 weeks. So he's previously been vague on whether he would vote on the proposed 15-week federal abortion plan. Was this any different? And really, I mean, local political leaders, that feels like it could be an opening for Democrats. 
Yeah, Joe, you know, he he uh, once again was vague uh, when he was asked directly about whether he would support that Lindsey Graham 15 week abortion ban. Yes or no. And he said, look, I'm against any federal intervention whatsoever, suggesting he'd be against it, but not necessarily 100 percent closing the door. Um, and Democrats ended up pouncing on those remarks that he would leave abortion up to a woman, a doctor and local political leaders and even just John Fetterman was able to interject at one point, like uh, Doug Mastriano, the Republican nominee for governor, who, of course, is stridently anti-abortion. Both candidates also discussed their support for the current president, Joe Biden, or the former president, Donald Trump. So how did they embrace their respective party leaders? And will that hurt or help either of them at the voting booth? Yeah, I'm not so sure it helps or hurts at the, at the voting booth, but they were asked directly uh, about 2024 uh, in a hypothetical situation if Donald Trump or Joe Biden end up facing uh, each other again. And we ended up hearing uh, Mehmet Oz saying that, yes, he's a supporter of Donald Trump and would back him if Donald Trump runs for president. And likewise, John Fetterman said that uh, President Joe Biden would get his support if he runs, but that ultimately will be President Biden's decision if he seeks another term. Mark, while we have you, let's touch on the governor's debate in Michigan between the Democratic incumbent Gretchen Whitmer and Republican Tudor Dixon. Both candidates discussed school safety, which has become a major issue for voters. Let's listen to that. I would like to have armed security at our schools. I would like to make sure that we have a one entry point. I would also like to implement some of that plan that talks about how to identify a child that struggles with mental health that might be considering self-harm or harming someone else. We've been trying that for 30 years. It's not working. It is time to try proven policies, background checks, secure storage, red flag laws. I'm not talking about hunting. I'm just trying to keep our kids and communities safe. So clear distinction there. What did you make of that exchange and just thoughts on that debate overall? Yeah, Joe, you know, again, that's kind of your generic Republican versus Democratic uh, talking points when it comes to issues of school violence and gun violence. I was really struck by the, uh, the clash on abortion rights. Uh, Michigan is having a big uh, ballot uh, measure whether to enshrine abortion rights in the state. You end up having Gretchen Whitmer, the incumbent, supporting that measure. Tudor Dixon, the challenger, opposing it. Uh, Joe, another high stakes debate last night, all with less than two weeks to go. All right. All right, Mark Murray, thanks so much for breaking it down. We appreciate it. And now to the governor's race in New York. Incumbent Governor Kathy Hochul taking on Republican opponent Congressman Lee Zeldin last night in their only scheduled televised debate. NBC News correspondent Ron Allen joins us now. Ron, thanks for being with us. So Hochul had the lead here at one point. It was pretty big, but now the race is tightening. So this debate came at a crucial time. What were the big takeaways? And you think anything here that will move the needle on Election Day? I guess that remains to be seen. It was a very feisty back and forth, a lot of passion. Both candidates are are, are not well known across the state. Hochul is the governor, but remember, she got the job when Andrew Cuomo had to resign in disgrace, and Lee Zeldin's a congressman from uh, from Long Island. So both for both of them, this was an opportunity to have a big statewide audience for the first time, perhaps, in this campaign, and to really get their message out to a big audience. Uh, so both were very engaged. There were no knockout blows, no major gaffes, and we'll see what the polls do after this. And, of course, what the voters do, early voting starts this coming weekend here. One of Zeldin's main campaign issues is crime. I want to ask you about a couple of these issues here, actually interestingly, similarly to the conversations that Joe just had with Mark a second ago. But crime was brought up multiple times last night, even during a discussion about abortion, actually. What is Zeldin's strategy here and how did Hochul respond? It's one of the pillars of his campaign. He's had campaign appearances at crime scenes in the New York subway system, which, of course, has been a big issue in terms of crime. Uh, he has been basically saying that on his first day in office that he would declare a state of emergency because of the crime problem that's happening, not just in New York City, but across the state. Here's what the candidates had to say in exchange on the issue of crime. Take a listen. There are criminals out there who need to pay the consequences for their action instead of the catch release policies that Kathy Hochul champions. It is a joke to talk about a crime policy that doesn't include doing something about illegal guns. When you had the chance as a member of Congress to stand with other Republicans who finally said enough is enough, you were nowhere to be found, Lee. 
she's referring to the congressional vote about gun safety issues that finally did happen after the shooting in Buffalo and, and in Uvalde. Uh, she kept pivoting back to things in Congress that Zeldin didn't support that were bipartisan um, as she tried to, again, focus on the issue of guns, not just crime. Um, so that was a lot of back and forth on that. But crime has been the issue that the polls suggest has been helping Zeldin make progress as he's trying to narrow the gap between the two of them. Absolutely. Let's now talk about that other issue I just mentioned, abortion. Of course, a hot button topic across the country. How's it playing out here in New York? Well, this has been Kathy Hochul's issue for the most part of reproductive rights, and she is honed in on that as the campaign has gone on. Uh, Zeldin uh, is, has, has voted, uh, is against uh, the Supreme Court decision on, on Dobbs, and um, so here's what they had to say about abortion. Zeldin was trying to, uh, back, trying to maintain his pro-life position, but he seized on an issue about women coming into the state of New York and, and abortions being paid for by taxpayers to try and get around the issue somewhat. Here's what he had to say about that and Hochul's response. Take a listen. And I've actually heard from a number of people who consider themselves to be pro-choice, who are not happy hearing that their tax dollars are being used to fund abortions many, many, many states away. Lee, you can't run from your record. You're the only person standing on this stage whose name right now, not in years past, but right now, is on a bill called Life Begins at Conception. As has been the case in other races across the country, abortion was a bigger issue months ago than it is now. Crime, again, seems to be the issue that's dominating and animating the race here now. And Ron, last question before I let you go. Another issue that came up is Zeldin's ties to Trump. What impact has that had? <laughs> This is a tough one for him because Trump is not popular here in New York, uh, of course. He uh, is a Trump ally. He voted to not certify the results of the election. Uh, Hochul cast him as a, an election denier. Here's what Zeldin had to say about his ties to Trump. Take a listen. Do you want to see Donald Trump run for president in 2024, Lee Zeldin? Not even thinking about it. I'm focused on 14 days from today, defeating Kathy Hochul and saving New York State. Would you vote to certify the results of the 2020 election? Well, the vote was on two states, Pennsylvania and Arizona. The issue still remains today. He said essentially that he would not vote to certify the results of the election, sticking to that. Hochul was asked if Biden should run for president, and she said uh, in 2024, and she said yes. A lot of national issues throughout this, this throughout the d debate here, throughout the campaign here, um, and that's what's making this race important. Uh, but again, this is has been Kathy Hochul's race to lose, if you will. Mm -hmm. She's been ahead by double digits. There were a couple of polls last week that made it more that made it put it in the single digits, which is why there's more attention focused on this now. Yeah. But again, New York is a big, big blue state, and uh, it seems that Hochul is still has a lead, although it's just uh, how big it is or small it is, of course, the voters will decide. Ron Allen, thank you so much. We'll be watching. As Election Day approaches, many poll workers are coming under pressure. NBC News correspondent Blaine Alexander is more on why some have decided to quit. Angie Jones never thought she would become a poll worker. I voted, you know, as most Americans do, but I've never really been involved in the political process. But the 2016 election changed all of that. After that election happened that I needed to be part of the solution. Her solution? Training to become a poll manager in Fulton County, Georgia. People who, who come to your polls and say, I don't trust this process. What do you want them to know about the work that you do? Well, first of all, come join us. Take the training. If people would understand the process more, I feel like they would be less fearful that their votes are not secure. Angie has worked every election since 2018, but none like Georgia's 2021 runoff that gave Democrats control of the Senate. After the 2020 election, did you notice a change? Immediately, I noticed a change. I had a lot of voters that came in angry distrustful and election workers were increasingly targeted by conspiracy theories like Shay Moss and her mother Ruby Freeman who also worked in Fulton County. This turned my life upside down. According to the Brennan Center for Justice, one in five election workers say they are unlikely to serve through 2024. One in six have personally experienced threats. Angie says she will never forget asking a friend to sign up. She said no. Uh, she was afraid. 
And I remember she said to me, people will say things to me that they would never say to you. Because she's a woman of color. Because she's a woman of color. Georgia was at the center of efforts to overturn the 2020 election, something election official Gabriel Sterling called dangerous. It had all gone too far. All of it. Are you concerned that there could be similar threats this time around? I'm sure there will be. You have to be aware of it, but you can't over prepare for it. Did you ever think about just walking away? No, never, never. My responsibility is to do everything that I can do within my power at that precinct to protect the vote. Blaine Alexander, NBC News, Atlanta. And with candidates hitting the home stretch, Meet the Press Now is hitting the road. Chuck Todd will be talking to voters, candidates, and officials today on a special edition of MTP Now, live from Pittsburgh. Coverage starts at 4 p.m. Eastern. And turning now to the latest on the January 6th investigation, NBC News has now learned that Hope Hicks, who served as a top advisor to former President Trump, has interviewed with the House Committee investigating the insurrection. That's according to a source familiar with the matter. Now, Hicks served in multiple senior roles in the Trump White House for much of his presidency, but left her job as counselor to the president just six days after January 6th. This interview also comes just days after the committee subpoenaed the former president himself. For more, let's bring in NBC News Capitol Hill correspondent Ali Rafa. Ali, good to have you with us on this. So do we have any idea what Hicks said during her testimony yesterday and what the committee was hoping to hear from her in the first place? Yeah, good morning, Savannah. Unfortunately, no official comment from Hope Hicks or the January 6th committee as far as what she was able to uh, tell the committee. But we do know that Hope Hicks was one of the earliest advisors to Trump and his family, going so far back as 2015 when he was mulling uh, a run for the presidency. And as you mentioned at the top there, while she did leave the White House, she came back and was part of former President Trump's inner circles during this critical period of time that the January 6th committee is interested in this period of time between Election Day and January 6th. Uh, the committee likely asking her questions about Trump's uh, thinking, Trump's communications during that time, because reportedly Hope Hicks told uh, former President Trump uh, repeatedly that he had lost the election. Uh, now, remember, the January 6th committee's whole argument during this over a year long investigation has been to prove that former President Trump was at the center of the uh, of the effort to overthrow, uh, overturn the election, uh, that uh, he was to blame for the January 6th attack on the Capitol. So that's definitely something that the committee uh, likely asked her about. How forthcoming she was with the committee is is still uh, under question because she has testified before a congressional committee in before in 2019, I'm sorry, in 2016 uh, and wasn't very forthcoming. She invoked her right to executive privilege during that time. Uh, of course, she doesn't work in the White House anymore, so she wouldn't be under the same restrictions this time. Uh, how forthcoming she was with the committee is still uh, still a big question we do have. Now, Ali, this all comes after the January 6th committee held its last scheduled hearing before the midterms. Where does the investigation stand right now, especially with less than two weeks to go to the election? Yeah, two weeks to go to the election. And remember, this committee is only active as a committee until a new Congress is sworn in in January. And they still have a lot of things to cross off of their to-do list. Remember, the committee still doesn't know whether former President Trump will comply with this subpoena for testimony on November uh, 14th for documents that members have said may be even more enlightening than that testimony uh, on November 4th. And the committee is trying to wrap this all up, like I said, by January. January. They're trying to use their time wisely. Uh, the big question now is if Trump doesn't comply with that subpoena, what will the committee plan to do in that short amount of time? They have the option to uh, refer a contempt of Congress criminal referral to the Justice Department, similar to what we saw with Steve Bannon, or they could use this time uh, to refer what members have called other uh, criminal contempt referrals for other crimes that they say that they can prove Trump uh, has committed. What they do with this remaining time is still a big question we have. All right, Ali Rafa, thank you so much. In Ukraine this morning, at least two people have died after Russian missiles hit a gas station in the city of Dnipro. The violence comes as Russian forces in Kherson brace for what one Ukrainian official called, quote, the heaviest of battles. NBC News foreign correspondent Matt Bradley has the latest from Kyiv. 
Good morning, guys. Ukraine passed another night with some Russian bombardment in the eastern part of the country, this time in the city of Dnipro, where two people were killed in Russian attacks. And there have been continued to be rolling blackouts throughout this country after nearly two weeks of constant Russian attacks on electricity installations. Now, this country is still bracing at this moment for two major events that really are just about to happen, both of them very ominous. The first one, and I think you've heard about this, that news of the dirty bomb just over the weekend. Russia uh, called foreign, excuse me, defense ministers from throughout the world and sort of projected this notion that it was the Ukrainians who are trying to create a nuclear device and to detonate it here in Ukraine against their own people and then to blame it on the Russians in a kind of false flag attack. Now, this has been you know, met with wide opprobrium from governments throughout the world, basically all of them calling it a Russian lie and a pretext for Russia's own escalation of the war. Now, what we've been hearing uh, from the state energy company and one of the state energy companies is that it looks as though the Russians are digging into some nuclear waste in the eastern city of Zaporizhia. Now, that has put pay to the claims of the Ukrainians that it is the Russians who are planning on creating a dirty bomb, detonating it and blaming it on the Ukrainians. It's a confusing situation, but a very troubling one for folks here. Now, all that is happening as Ukrainian forces prepare to retake the southern city of Kherson. That was one of the cities that was the first to fall to Russian forces. Now, that city has almost emptied out completely. I've been speaking to some people down there. They say that there's just an ominous sort of calm as Russian troops have vacated the city and have demanded that civilians, as many as possible, leave the city as well. It sounds as though they are prepared, the Russians and the Ukrainians, for a blistering battle in the southern city of Kherson, one that might not even leave that city standing. Guys? All right, Matt Bradley. Matt, thank you so much. And now to your morning news now. Weather, a lot of people are breaking out the rain boots this morning. I don't know if I have rain boots. Do you have rain boots? <laughs> no, I have snow boots. So, yeah, yeah, I do too. All right. Meteorologist but remember Michelle those Hunter boots, us. right? Oh, those yeah. really cute. Oh, yeah. I, right? They were I like really huge. Those. I don't yeah. think I ever wore them in the rain, <laughs> but I wore them to like, you know, the fun festival yeah. stuff. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Fall yeah. festival stuff. Uh, but you definitely need the rain in spots. But we digress. <laughs> but we digress. <laughs> and where are those boots anyway? They're so, and they're pink. Yeah, I'll oh, wear next Wednesday. Right. Yeah, they're really cute. <laughs> All right. So rain in the northeast, rain in the northwest, and then we're looking at really dry conditions in the middle of the country. So here is that rain in the northeast. We had that slow-moving cold front. It's taking forever to move its way along the east coast, and it will finally exit tomorrow morning. But before that, we're looking at the, the cold front stretching from the Great Lakes all the way down to the southeast. Along this front, we're looking at heavy rain. Where you see these brighter colors, that's where we're looking at the heaviest rain. We're not expecting severe weather like we saw the past two days, but still could see a thunderstorm or two. The main threat here will be some wind along that front and also some heavy, heavy rains. As we zoom in a little closer, we also have a secondary uh, area of low pressure. That's going to bring some heavy rain to portions of Maine. We could see even three inches of flash flooding in spots as we go throughout tonight into tomorrow morning. So heavy rain in New England today. That cold front stretches to the southeast. It moves slowly and will finally exit tomorrow morning. Generally, we're looking at one, two, three inches of rain, most of that falling in portions of Maine. Bangor, Portland, along the coast here, we are looking at the heaviest amounts there. Now, as we go throughout the day here, we're looking at some really warm temperatures ahead of this front. So we've been seeing this all week long where we're looking at that cold front ahead of it. It's really warm. Back behind it, we're looking at frigid air. So that warm east coast, temperatures well above normal ones again, into the 60s, into the 70s, about 20 degrees above normal for this time of year in spots. Burlington, Vermont, we're looking at 73, 64 today in Boston, 66 in Buffalo, 70s in D.C., also in Norfolk and down to Raleigh. We're going to keep that warm air in place for another day before we return to more seasonal temperatures. And then back behind in this front, we've been talking about this all week long. This front is really bringing in some very cold air from Canada. It's dropping those temperatures about 30 degrees. So we're looking at 30s and 40s, 50s, 32 degrees tomorrow in Telluride. We're looking at 36 in Jackson. That's going to set the stage for some snow tonight into tomorrow. We could see eight inches of snow wow. in some spots in the Cascades and also so into the Rockies. So the West stays unsettled. It's been settled all week. We're looking at a series of storms. It's called the um, Atmospheric River. You've heard about that. So it's just water coming off the Pacific. 
So we're going to keep it unsettled for the next few days. Today, the rain and mountain snow over parts of the Rockies. Another Pacific storm moves into Washington tomorrow, and that's where we're going to see that snow. So where you see the blue in portions of Utah, also New Mexico, the four corners, you have a chance of seeing some snowflakes. Lower elevation rainfall totals. The heaviest rain falling in portions of Washington. So Seattle, you could see some heavy rain as well. And where you see the pinks and the really pretty colors, the blues, uh, we're looking at that highest elevation snow. This is tomorrow also. We're going to see that front move moving off to the east, that second one, and that's going to kind of tap into some golf moisture. So it's going to bring the chance of severe wet weather. Not today, but tomorrow. Winds gusting up to 60 miles per hour. Could see some hail and the chance of a few tornadoes. So here's a snapshot for today. That heavy rain in portions of the northeast. Sunshine returns to the middle of the country. Looking really good there, guys. Temperatures in the 60s, 70s, 80s in portions of Texas and dry with some sunshine. Halloween weather. <laughs> yeah, exactly. exactly. Yeah. Oh, look at that. Heavy Wear rain. the lightest costume. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. 60s, 70s. Ugh. All right, yeah. All right, thanks, Michelle. See you in a little bit. Uh -huh. Coming up on Morning News Now, a key meeting at the White House. Yeah, President Biden will be meeting with Israel's president ahead of the country's elections. What this meeting means for crucial issues like Ukraine, Iran, and the world's oil supply. That's next. Welcome back. President Biden is set to host his Israeli counterpart at the White House later this morning. Yesterday, the Israeli president met with Secretary of State Antony Blinken and House Speaker Nancy Pelosi. The visit comes amid a surge in violence in the occupied West Bank. More than 100 Palestinians have been killed this year following a series of raids and crackdowns by Israeli forces. NBC News senior digital White House reporter Shannon Pettypiece joins us now with more on this. So, Shannon, good morning. First of all, what's on the agenda for today's meeting? Well, certainly no shortage of issues for these two leaders to talk about. Um, there was a recent uh, deal brokered by the U.S. Uh, between Israel and Lebanon over a maritime border. Uh, it involves also uh, some natural gas resources there. That's something that's been a big deal in Israel. Uh, expect the White House to bring that up and to be touting that as well. Certainly more broadly, the ongoing war in Ukraine is going to be a topic of discussion. Uh, there has been reports, obviously, recently about Russian drones, I'm sorry, Iranian drones being supplied to Russia and those attacking Ukraine. That is something that President Herzog brought up in a meeting with the Secretary of State, Antony Blinken, pressuring the U.S. to, to up the uh, pressure on Iran to respond to that. But here's a little bit more of what White House Press Secretary Karine Jean-Pierre had to say about the upcoming visit. The two leaders will consult on a range of regional and global challenges of mutual concern, including the threat posed by Iran and its proxies. They will also discuss the forthcoming conclusion of a historic agreement resolving the maritime boundary dispute between Israel and Lebanon, mediated by the United States. President Biden will also underscore his commitment to advancing peace and stability in the Middle East and beyond by deepening Israel's regional integration and normalization with the Arab world. And they will discuss ways to promote equal measures of freedom, prosperity, and security for both Israelis and Palestinians. And certainly it will be an opportunity again for these two leaders to show the close alliance and support for one another between the U.S. and Israel. And Shannon, Ukraine has criticized Israel for its lack of support in the war with Russia. I mean, just yesterday, President Zelensky called on Israel again to share its air defense systems, but so far it's refused to do so. Do you think we could see the Biden administration put pressure on Israel to do more on that front? Yeah, and that was some very strong criticism from President Zelensky. Um, obviously, this was an issue the president uh, brought up back in July when he was meeting with Israeli officials in Israel. Um, you know, so far the Israelis have been providing humanitarian support. They've been providing life-saving equipment like helmets and bulletproof vests. Uh, they have not wanted to provide anything like air defense systems or uh, defensive mm. weapons. You know, the belief being that Israel's concerned it could disrupt their relationship with Russia when it comes to Syria being one of the key national security concerns in their region. The U.S., however, though, has made it very clear their belief uh, that allies and the U.S. and their NATO partners need to do everything they can 
to support Ukraine in this. I wouldn't be surprised if that was raised by the president again, but certainly mm. the White House, the president, are aware of the position that Israel is in here and trying to balance their own regional security concerns as well. And Shannon, quickly on this last point, this meeting comes less than a week before Israel's fifth election in four years. Well, of course, our midterms are less than two weeks away. So why is the meeting happening now? Well, you know, the White House and the Israeli officials addressed this as well, saying that you know it's an effort to show that the relationship between the U.S. and Israel goes beyond politics. And whichever mm. party is in control, uh, it, these two countries will remain aligned and committed to each other's security. Of course, the optics are a bit questionable here, but yeah, I will say President Herzog uh, is not on the ballot. Uh, if certainly the Prime Minister um, Lapid was going to be at the White House, that would have a much different optic and dynamic. Uh, President Herzog has more of a ceremonial role, um, you know, but it could give uh, you know, some efforts in Israel a little bit of a, a bump here to see uh, the U.S. president sitting down with a certainly the Israeli president, very, very high prominent official in the country. All right, Shannon, thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thanks, Shannon. And coming up, mammograms can help detect breast cancer early and save lives. But for some patients at one Arizona hospital, that was not enough. Next, how their cancers were missed on their scans and what's being done now to make sure that doesn't happen again. We're back with a troubling look at dozens of misread mammograms that all link back to just one hospital. NBC News correspondent Kristen Dahlgren has more on a review of cases that showed many cancers were initially missed, even though they did appear on those scans. Jim and Pat Ratliff had a 54-year love story. We were just attached at the hip. Through ups and downs, including Pat's breast cancer more than a decade ago which is why she was so diligent about screening and concerned when she noticed changes in her other breast. She had imaging at a nearby hospital, part of NAH, Northern Arizona Healthcare. And they told her what? They couldn't find anything. Eventually, Pat saw breast surgeon Beth Dupree. I literally couldn't believe what I was seeing. It was screaming cancer. Advanced breast cancer. Two years later, Pat was gone. Dr. Dupree had just moved to Sedona to develop a state-of-the-art breast center at NAH. Pat was just the first patient, she says, who came to her with a cancer missed on previous scans. These were misses that were not subtle. The hospital has an exclusive contract with Northern Arizona Radiology. Dupree, who says she continued to flag misread mammograms, pushed them to hire dedicated breast imagers, including Mike Ulissi, who couldn't believe some of what he says was missed. I said, my God, Beth, that's the size of a tangerine. I don't understand how they can call it normal. The hospital requested the radiology group have those new breast imagers review more than 6,000 patients whose scans had initially been read by a particular general radiologist. Ulysses says they found cancer in an additional 25 women. The uh, recommendation was returned in a year. Among them, Christy Gallo. My question was, how could I go from normal to having three tumors in one year? That didn't make sense to me. Dr. Dupree believes the number of patients with missed cancers was much greater than the 25 detected in the review. She made a poster with all of her patients whose diagnoses she says were delayed, hoping to show it to the hospital board. We're only showing those who gave us permission. It must be hard to look at their faces. It is. NBC News obtained an email from one of the breast imagers to the radiology group sent before the review was complete, warning of the gravity of the situation. After the review, there was still concern. We thought that there were a significant chance that, that additional patients were in harm's way. We needed to expand our investigation. And we but Dr. Ulysses says the radiology group did not. In a statement to NBC, NAH points out the radiology group is a separate entity and says in part the hospital quickly acted to address these concerns. We ensured these mammograms were reread specifically by a team of breast fellowship trained radiologists, saying very few required any follow up. And since this review, all mammograms are read by specialized breast radiologists. The hospital's chief counsel spoke right on a Zoom with community advisors. Process. So the quality process worked. There was an error. We're humans. Doctors are humans. They messed up, and, uh, and they don't want to fess up to it.
Northern Arizona Radiology called the review results well within national standards. In a statement, it says all radiologists are board certified and meet all requirements, including those under the Mammography Quality Standards Act. Patient, Dupree right. and this three out of four new breast imagers, including Dr. Ulysses, have now left. NBC News has learned the general radiologist who was the subject of the review is now working in another state. As for Gallo, her cancer is in remission, but she's not sure the questions will ever go away. Maybe if they had caught it sooner, it could have been a um, just a lumpectomy instead of a whole mastectomy uh, choice, but I didn't get that choice. Operating room here. Kristen Dahlgren, NBC News, Sedona, Arizona. Time now for our weekly checkup this morning. We are looking at how climate change could be affecting both your physical and mental health. Yeah, plus how the food options in your neighborhood might be impacting your heart. Lots of important good stuff today. We have NBC News senior medical correspondent Dr. John Torres here on set to walk us through all this. Doctor, good to have you here. Uh, so let's start with something we teased at the top of the show also. It's new research about how climate change could be impacting our health. Everything from heat-related deaths to air pollution. It's actually being called a global health crisis. Tell us about this. And this is a global report that came out looking at climate change. And I think we all know climate change is here. Climate change is affecting a lot of things. But this is showing just how much climate change is affecting our health, and particularly air pollution. And what they found is that air pollution ends up hurting every organ in our body. There's nothing that goes unscathed because of air, of air pollution. And of the climate change issues, heat is probably the leading cause of weather-related deaths that are out there for a variety of different reasons. You know, it changes the cycle of hurricanes. It changes how they approach things. And then also, you see there, it can increase in infectious diseases. We're hearing about Zika. We're hearing about chikungunya, these other diseases we hadn't heard about years ago. And it can also it can also affect your mental health, which is a big thing. And one thing the report really focuses on is kind of the racial and ethnic uh, inequities that are happening because of this, because it tends to hit those regions harder. And so they're saying, you know, we all need to do our part. And these are the doctor's orders. You know, do your part that you can do to help this, get this under control. We always think that as an individual, we can't really have much of an effect. We typically can. You know, we talk about you know, carpooling, walking, yeah. composting, those different types of things. Uh, re go ahead and reduce, reuse, recycle. That thing we've been talking about since the 1970s mm -hmm. or maybe even the 60s. But on top of that, keep as healthy as you can. That's probably the biggest message going mm -hmm. forward. And speaking of that, that gets us to our next study, which shows the link between the food options we have and then the risk of heart failure, death from heart failure. I mean, what does this tell us about how important the food we eat? And I've probably talked 10,000 times about eating your fruits and vegetables. Mm -hmm. That's not always an option for some people because they live in what we call fruit deserts or food deserts where they don't have that availability. And what this report is looking at, this study looked at 86,000 people, it's a global study, and they found that if you live in an area that has less amounts of food, you're gonna end up dying more from heart failure. Here in the US, we have about 86,000 deaths from heart failure. And heart failure simply means your heart gets weak to the point where it can't pump blood to where the blood needs to go to. Biggest factor behind this was poverty and socioeconomic issues because they don't have access to that healthy food. So what are the doctor's orders? Well, the doctor's orders basically here are to go ahead and try and look into community-based produce programs to see if you can help out there, see if, you know, even in your own community, these things can be helped, and volunteer in your town to go ahead and try and help overcome these food inequities, these food deserts to help other people out. This is, you know, kind of, a, it does take a village type of situation. Out, yeah. Absolutely good ideas there. All right, lastly, we have this study, 28,000 people involved actually, and it's giving us our strongest evidence ever on a link between blood pressure and dementia. Talk to us about this. And we know blood pressure, we always think of cardiovascular effects, yeah, you know, heart and, and heart attack type situations and strokes, but now we're finding out that blood pressure can actually increase your chances of getting dementia huh. if it's high, and more importantly, lowering blood pressure can really help. And by lowering it, we're talking even just a few points. You know, that, that first number that was systolic, we call it, they say, said 10, dropping at 10 points can really substantially incre increase your chances of not getting dementia. And what they did is they looked at a variety of techniques for lowering blood pressure, and they found it didn't really matter what technique you used. It just mattered that you used a technique and you got your blood pressure under control long term. So what are doctor's orders behind this? Well, obviously, doctor's orders are, you know, to try and get your blood pressure down as much as possible. Reduce your weight. That can certainly go a long way. You know, scale down the salt. That can Ooh. help, too. And if those don't work, then definitely, and, and probably one of even bigger messages is check your blood pressure. Mm -hmm. It's a silent killer. A lot of people don't know they have high blood pressure. That's the starting point. And doctors have options to help you with that, right? Lots of options. Yeah. All right, watch your waistline. That's a good one. Easy to remember. <laughs> Dr. Right. Torres, thanks so much. You it's bet. Good to have Thank you. Here. you.
Coming up, a new pushback on a controversial pipeline that would run through the Midwest. He objects the powerful alliance formed between Native American tribes and farmers to stop construction and why developers want to move forward with the project. Stay with us. And we're back with financial headlines and Visa seeing a jump in quarterly earnings. NBC's yes, Silvana Hanau joins us with that another financial news. Hey, Silvana. Hey, good morning, guys. Well, Visa reporting upbeat quarterly earnings as more Americans take advantage of the strong dollar to fly overseas and splurge on shopping and entertainment. Now, we heard similar comments from rival American Express last week. That underscores the strength in consumer spending, which has largely managed to shrug off worries about inflation and rising interest rates. But Visa says the strong dollar doesn't bode well for the U.S. tourism industry, which relies on a big chunk of its revenue from international travelers. Lyft is relaunching its pink membership plan at half the previous price, so that's $10 a month or $99 a year. The focus is now more on perks than discounts on rides. Members get free priority pickups and at least 5% off preferred Lux and Excel rides. You'll also get three free cancellations per month, a free bike or scooter unlock each month, free car rental upgrades, and discounts on Grubhub Plus deliveries. Shoppers may be experiencing sticker shock in the Halloween candy aisle. The Labor Department says candy prices are up more than 13% from a year ago. That's the largest ever annual increase. Candy makers say rising labor costs and higher prices for flour and sugar are largely to blame, but they're trying to keep treats affordable. Hershey says it hasn't raised prices of some candy since June, while Mars says it's absorbed extra cost wherever possible. Mm -hmm. Joe and Savannah? I, I'm giving away Rice Krispie treats for Halloween. So. Oh, wow. Oh. How, do, how do those work in the basket? Do they sell well, I buy the mini ones. I already have oh. them ready. It's like okay. the mini ones, All but right. they're delicious. I have, delicious. Rice so I have okay. to hide Good them for call. myself. I have this image of you just taking them out of the pan and putting them in. All right. Mm. <laughs> Thank you so much. Not homemade. It. <laughs> Thanks. All right. A battle is brewing in middle America this morning. Native American activists and farmers are now forming a powerful alliance to stop the construction of a controversial new carbon dioxide pipeline. This morning, we have a joint report report on the topic. NBC News Investigations teamed up with Kara Levin, our NBC affiliate in Minneapolis. Carla Hulp brings us the story. Over half the corn grown here in Iowa goes to ethanol plants like this one. We receive about 100 trucks of corn a day. The promise of ethanol was a cleaner, more renewable fuel. It's going to go up these conveyors. We'll run it through some grinders. We'll break that corn up into smaller particles, and then we'll bring it into the ethanol plant, and it will be fermented and into that alcohol. It will make that ethanol molecule. But it emits concentrated CO2. You look, look at that stack there. That's where our CO2 is being emitted. Now a new company called Summit Carbon Solutions says they can capture it. We'll be removing or preventing 12 million metric tons of CO2 from being released to the atmosphere. That's like removing 2.6 million vehicles off the road. Summit plans to spend $4.5 billion to construct over 2,000 miles of pipeline from origin points in Minnesota, Nebraska, Iowa, and the Dakotas. It's designed to transport that CO2 from the ethanol plants up to a sequestration location or storage location in North Dakota and will permanently store that CO2 um, in place underground. But activist Joy Braun worries construction could disturb Native American graves and artifacts. I fight pipelines and I fight colonialism and this site kind of represents all of that. Joy spoke with us at Whitestone Hill in North Dakota, a sacred site to Native peoples for centuries, where in 1863, the U.S. Army killed an estimated 150 to 300 Native American men, women, and children. The one thing that I know about pipeline companies and those that they contract with is they don't care. The company is suggesting that the pipeline will run as far as 17 miles away from Whitestone Hill. A, do you agree with that? And B, is that far enough? Far enough would, be, would mean that they don't build it. Summit says they have asked tribal governments for input and have multiple layers of protection against impacting native sites. 
We've put together an unanticipated discovery plan that we'll train all of our contractors to that says, if you see something that looks like it could be an artifact or something of interest, you stop the job. We get an archeologist out there, we coordinate with the states, we coordinate with the tribes, we look at it. Farmer Ed Fishback in South Dakota says Summit approached him about routing the pipeline through his land. It would be coming in at the far southeast corner and cutting diagonally across where this corn is. While some local farmers have already signed easement deals with Summit, Fishback is uniting with other farmers who have concerns about the pipeline, like potential CO2 leaks. It's an asphyxiant, so all of us with livestock or concerned about our families or our own benefit, we just don't trust this to be a safe product to be transporting. Over the weekend, dozens become sick and even more had to leave their homes after a gas leak and explosion in Yazoo County. Summit says that pipeline carried a different type of more toxic, naturally occurring CO2 mixed with hydrogen sulfide. But some energy experts say risks remain. There isn't really enough experience with these pipelines to be able to say they'll be safe going forward for five years or 10 years or 15 years. And our thanks to Carla Holt and the entire NBC Investigations team for that story. And coming up, whether you like the big cities or nature, there's a new list to help you pick out your next trip. We've got the latest list of some of the best destinations to visit for all interests coming up. Welcome back. We've got another climate story for you on this Wednesday morning. A NASA instrument nicknamed EMIT has identified large swaths of greenhouse gas emissions around the globe, most notably methane. It has revealed more than 50 methane super emitters in Central Asia, the Middle East, and Southwestern U.S., some of them among the largest ever seen from space. Scientists say one particular site in Turkmenistan released an estimated 111,000 pounds of methane an hour, rivaling one of the largest accidental methane releases here in the U.S. NASA is hopeful that EMIT will find more potential super emitters in the future. Is that wow. an important thing going on there? Absolutely. Lots of climate change news this morning also for us to all be exactly. paying attention to. All right, believe it or not, 2022 is coming to a close. And for all you travel enthusiasts, that means it's time to start planning your vacations for the new year. Yeah, we were just talking about this last night, my husband and I. This morning, National Geographic just unveiled its annual Best of the World list, showcasing 25 destinations to inspire your next trip. For more on this, we are joined by senior editor for National Geographic Travel, Amy Olipio. Amy, thanks so much for joining us. Good to have you with us. So National Geographic graphics split the top 25 into locations five different categories so before yeah. we get into all the different spots tell us about the categories and the criteria used to make your choices yeah thank you so much i'm always excited to chat about our list of it's our annual celebration of inspiring places for the following year and it was especially meaningful to work on it this year as we've almost fully returned to travel mm -hmm. and we really wanted to recapture that sense of awe and wonder mm -hmm. in our planet um, so even if you're not traveling right now, these are places to be amazed at. And so this list is a collaboration with our network of Natio explorers, writers, and editorial teams around the world who nominate the best places for the coming year based on five categories, um, adventure, nature, history and culture, family, and uh, new this year community, which um, oh. is a category where we highlight places where, you know, tourism is supporting or giving back to local communities or ecosystems. Oh, how neat. I think we'll get more into that in just a second. But first, all right, we got to know what landed at the top of each of these five lists. Oh my gosh, so it's really hard to pick because really all of these, each of these is like a success story. You know, I mean, we have in, uh, in our community category, we have Alberta, Canada, which is a Canadian province, which is a leader in indigenous tourism. Um, in our nature category, for example, we have Big Bend National Park, where, you know, national parks have been loved to death recently. So Big Bend is, gets a fraction of the visitors that Yellowstone does, for mm. example. Um, in our culture category, we have Egypt, which is seeing the long-awaited opening of the Grand Egyptian Museum. Um, and in um, adventure, we have Chokekirao, which is the sister city of Machu Picchu, really. It's like these Incan Ooh. ruins high up in the Andes. And in family, we have places like San Francisco, where, you know, it's a known destination, but they're doing new things like that Presidio Tunnel Tops. This is amazing new kind of playground on re, re, um, reclaimed land right there on the bay. 
I'm intrigued by the community category that you mentioned in Alberta. Canada, I believe, was at the top of that list. Why did you decide to do a community category? I think we wanted to highlight, you know, how tourism is supporting or giving back to local communities or ecosystems in some way, um, whether it's through um, accessibility, um, greater accessibility to communities, whether it's uh, through women-led um, uh, tours, whether it's um, d diving into heritage like Ghana is, um, and or whether it's kind of just like supporting cultural communities. Absolutely. All right. Not to put you on the spot, but also to put you on the spot because you're an expert and we have you. Out of all of these, out of these 25 places in the world, which one would you recommend most? What's on the top of your list for next year? Oh my gosh, I think I might have mentioned already Chukekirao in Peru, which can I mention it more? Yes, please. <laughs> because you know, <laughs> it's just like this place that is like the epitome of National Geographic adventure. It's these um, Incan mm. ruins high up in the Andes. You can get there only by foot right now. And it gets a fraction wow. of the visitors that um, Machu Picchu does. And you've been to all 25 of these places, right? <laughs> <laughs> No. No. <laughs> really not. Add to my bucket list. All right. There you go. That's the, that's the yeah. fun. You got to have for one all on of your us. List. Yeah. Exactly. Thanks for doing the work for us. And I know we went through those lists kind of quickly. Don't worry. You can find the full list on the National Geographic website, nationalgeographic.com. Amy, thanks so much for joining us this morning and sharing some fun adventures to get our juices flowing for travel next year. Yeah. We appreciate it. Yeah. It's a Thank good time to plan. Me. Happy travels. Very exciting. Yeah. You too. <laughs> that does it for this hour of Morning News Now. But the news continues right now, so stick with us. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.